At six, Boris Johnson fights for his political career as he is grilled by MPs over lockdown parties in Downing Street. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. During a marathon session, he stressed that he believed at the time that many of the gatherings were necessary for work. I'm here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith and on the basis of what I honestly knew and believed at the time. The group of MPs are investigating whether Boris Johnson deliberately or recklessly made misleading statements to Parliament about a number of lockdown gatherings in Downing Street. It is about the truth, and that is why this inquiry goes to the heart of the trust on which our system of accountability depends. We will have all the details also on the programme. A surprise jump in inflation last month as food prices rise at their fastest rate in 45 years. 15 people are in hospital after this ship tipped over in a dry dock in Edinburgh. And the search for relatives of one of the UK's last World War II veterans who died alone in his flat in London ahead of his funeral next week. On BBC London, we get reaction from people in Boris Johnson's constituency as the former Prime Minister is quizzed over Partygate. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. It was a marathon session. Boris Johnson was grilled for more than three hours by a committee of MPs who were investigating whether he lied to Parliament about gatherings in Downing Street during lockdown. What they are trying to establish is whether misleading statements he admits making in the House of Commons when he denied that COVID rules or guidance were broken were inadvertent, reckless or intentional. The former Prime Minister insisted hand on heart he had not lied about the events in Number 10 and said he had believed that the gatherings were essential to thank staff for their work. He added that despite 10 months of investigations, the committee had no evidence against him. Here's our political editor, Chris Mason. One after another, the revelations came. The evidence stacked up, the defences fell. Boris Johnson's government stumbled and then collapsed. Today is about Mr Johnson's reputation, but it is bigger than that. Public debate is built on truth, something that toppled over under Boris Johnson. MPs are now trying to determine if the former Prime Minister lied to them. I swear by mighty God that the evidence I shall give for this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Being asked to take the oath is rare. Boris Johnson promising to tell the truth about whether he told the truth. And that, the chair of this inquiry underlined, is at the crux of all this. If what ministers tell us is not the truth, we can't do our job. Our democracy depends upon trust that what ministers tell MPs in the House of Commons is the truth. And without that trust, our entire parliamentary democracy is undermined. Prime Minister! And look at this, Boris Johnson having to look himself in the eye and watch what he had previously said. Uh, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. I'm here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith and on the basis of what I honestly knew and believed at the time. And so to his interrogation, the MPs testing his arguments. One of his Conservative colleagues asked him about this picture of a leaving do for a senior advisor, or what Mr Johnson called a farewell event. The guidance does not say uh, you can have a thank you party and as Sorry, many people can, in the room let, as you like, just, okay, if you think it's very important to thank people. The guidance doesn't say that. I, I accept that uh, not everybody is uh, perfectly socially distanced in that picture. But that did not mean to me, when I stood up in the House of Commons 
and said that the guidance was followed completely, I was not thinking of that event and thinking that somehow that contravened the guidance. Absolutely not. Okay. We, were, we were making a huge effort to follow the guidance. What about the get-togethers in the Downing Street Garden? Would you have advised anyone else in the country if they'd asked you at one of the press conferences at that time to have a large social gathering in the garden? It, it was not a large social gathering. It was, a, it, was, it was a gathering intended, and I really must insist on this point, People who say that we were partying in lockdown simply do not know what they are talking about. People who say that uh, that event was a purely social gathering are, are quite wrong. And then there was Boris Johnson's birthday do, which led to Mr Johnson and Rishi Sunak being fined for breaking the law. The pictures show that you attended a gathering in the Cabinet Room on this date to mark your birthday with at least 17 other people in attendance. Now, the attendees included your wife and your interior designer, didn't they? Uh, they? They certainly included my wife and son, and yes, there was a contractor who was working in the building who popped her head round the door very briefly. We've just confirmed that at least two people attended who were not work colleagues. Why did you think this was reasonably necessary for work purposes, as was required by the rules at the time? I thought it was uh, reasonably necessary for for work purposes because I was standing at my desk surrounded by officials who'd been asked to come and uh, wish me a happy birthday. Another committee member contrasted Mr Johnson's written testimony with what he told MPs. You say you don't believe that perfect compliance with social distancing was required by the guidance. If you believe this, why did you not make it clear when you told the House that the guidance was followed at all times? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Mr Carter. Perhaps if, if I'd elucidated more clearly what I meant and what I felt and believed about uh, following the guidance, uh, that would have helped. And listen to this, things getting testy about whether Boris Johnson was sufficiently curious about what was going on, where he lived and worked. The question is, why did you not take proper advice? This is complete nonsense. I mean, complete nonsense. I asked the relevant people. They were senior people. They'd been working very hard. And with that, after nearly three hours, it was over. Thank you very much. I've, I, I've much enjoyed our discussion. Well, I've, uh, I, I, I think it's been a useful, I genuinely think it's been a useful discussion. All of this leaves three questions tonight. Do the MPs believe him? Do you believe him? And what will a day like today mean for how our leaders conduct themselves in future? to Chris in Westminster now. It was long, it was heated. Boris Johnson gave a passionate defence. Was it enough? Well, I suspect in the court of public opinion, plenty of decisions, good or bad, have been made amongst our viewers tonight long ago about Boris Johnson. As far as the MPs are concerned, they now have to go away and look at the testimony from this afternoon, compare it with the reams and reams of written testimony from officials and former advisers and try and work out if the two things tie together or not. I suspect some might conclude that they don't. And then go back to the central thing that they are looking at, whether what he said in the House of Commons amounts to being misleading in a way that was reckless or intentional. And then in the coming weeks and months as they put their report together, they have to work out if it does what kind of suspension or censure uh, might be appropriate and then that will go to MPs to decide. It could lead to a by-election, him facing his electorate in his constituency in West London. We're several steps off that yet. But there's a bigger point here too, which I touched upon there, which is what does this mean for the state of public debate and discourse around the centrality, the vitality of truth? Does it reshape how much importance is attached to that for leaders in the future. And Chris, while all that was happening, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, published his tax details. What do they tell us? He did, yeah. So he's been promising to do this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And Downing Street deciding that this day of all days, this afternoon of all afternoons, was the time for them to put this out and let it see the light of day. It tells you that they didn't want a vast amount of attention to be focused upon it. What is within that tax return? Well, frankly, it tells us that a vastly wealthy man pays a vast amount of tax, around half a million pounds last year. But the timing tells you rather more 
than the numbers. They find all of this deeply uncomfortable. Of course it's eye-catching when the numbers are so big, but when eyes are diverted elsewhere, it garners rather less attention. Chris Mason, our political editor, thank you. And if you can't get enough of all this drama in Westminster this afternoon, there is plenty more for you. Do tune in to the BBC's newscast tonight with Adam Fleming, Chris Mason and Vicky Young. They will be discussing it all in more detail. You can watch it live on BBC iPlayer at 6.30 and you can also listen back later on BBC Sounds. Well, the Partygate hearing was interrupted early on so that MPs could go and vote on part of the Prime Minister's new agreement for post-Brexit trade in Northern Ireland. The government won the vote easily, despite two former Prime Ministers, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, voting against it, along with 20 other Conservatives. The vote was on what's known as the Stormont Break, which aims to give a future Northern Ireland Assembly a greater say on how EU laws apply to Northern Ireland. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, reports. Arguments about Brexit often feel like they're going over old ground, and this was no different. For years, politicians have tried to come up with a solution to Northern Ireland's trading arrangements. Today, Rishi Sunak told MPs his recent deal with Brussels was a significant breakthrough. Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Windsor framework represents a good deal for the people and families and businesses of Northern Ireland. It restores the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and ensures Northern Ireland's place in our precious union. On the face of it, this was a big win for the Prime Minister. The eyes to the right, 515. The nose to the left, 29. As the Commons backed his plan to give politicians in Northern Ireland a greater say on how new EU laws apply there, the so-called Stormont break. He's convinced some Brexiteers... At any time over the last seven years, if we'd been offered this deal as a United Kingdom as the way forward, we would have bitten their arms off. But not others. It, this will not work. It cannot work as a break because Stormont will not meet, meet because of it. And it gives amazing powers to the European Union. A chunk of Tory MPs led by these former Prime Ministers voted against the plan. One minister, no stranger to Brexit rebellion himself, urged Boris Johnson to fall into line. He's got a choice. He can be remembered for the great acts of statecraft that he achieved, or he can risk looking like a pound shop Nigel Farage. For Rishi Sunak, having two of your predecessors oppose you on such a significant issue could be a worrying sign that they're out to make trouble and destabilise your leadership. But in the end, the government was relieved that more Conservative MPs didn't join this rebellion. There is, though, another crucial matter that needs to be solved. The Northern Ireland Assembly hasn't been up and running for more than a year. The majority of parties there do back Mr Sunak's deal with the EU, but not the Democratic Unionist Party. Now he has to persuade them to return to Stormont. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. There was surprise today as the latest inflation figures rose unexpectedly last month from 10.1% in January to 10.4% in February. Analysts had widely predicted it would continue falling, but shortages of salad and vegetables, along with higher prices in cafes, pubs and restaurants, helped push the cost of living up again, with food prices rising at their fastest rate for 45 years. Here's our economics editor, Fazal Islam. Inflation on the rise again. A surprise to the markets and to the Bank of England no surprise to anyone actually buying or selling food. Chicken legs, free range bacon here, the fillets and the ribeyes. Oxtail as well down here. Such as Lucian Allen of a wholesale butcher's in Warwickshire. And it isn't just food. Last February, we spotted that obviously things were on the rise outside of the core product, which we'd seen for about 18 months before that. But it was really those miscellaneous costs around it, your packaging, your transport. We noticed they were going up. I hope to think that we've seen a peak in the packaging costs and things like that, but inflation continues to be very real and very present. The overall rate at which prices rise, the inflation rate, went back up again after being forecast to fall below 10%. Instead, it is still only a little below its 42-year high. It's still over five times the official target for inflation of just 2%. Still, it should fall from here as energy prices stabilise and then eventually fall. This is the official forecast from the budget in the orange. You can see it is for now proving a little 
sticky. The path to halving inflation proving a bumpier ride than forecast. And it's worth comparing with the major G7 economies. It's quite a bit lower elsewhere. In Europe, it's pretty close. But the UK was in February clearly the only one still in double digits, raising reasonable questions about whether the UK has become more inflation prone due to gas dependence or post-Brexit barriers to trade and workers. Now, food prices are driving this, so let's break that down, having a peek through a basket of groceries. Spreadable butter is up nearly a pound since this time last year. A dozen eggs is now £3.18, up 72 pence. And tomatoes are averaging £3.15 per kilo, 48 pence up. Even when inflation falls, these prices will still be going up, just by less than we saw over the past year. Food prices are on the whole at a new 45-year high for the annual rise of 18%, as you can see over there. Part of that is general post-Ukraine trend. Part is from the specific shortages we saw last month. Higher than expected inflation could affect the willingness of striking workers to settle their claims. And at a time when banking fragility across the world, including in the US, may have pointed to lower interest rates, high inflation means central banks here and in the US are under pressure to keep raising a balancing act that just got more difficult. And we have just heard in the last few minutes that the US Federal Reserve has again raised US-based interest rates and suggested more rises to come there to combat inflation. It also lowered the forecast for the US economy this year after the banking failures there. So no pause in rate rises. More on rates here from the Bank of England tomorrow. And if you want more analysis of what inflation means for you, along with useful tips and information, there's a special section on the BBC website called Tackling It Together. Find it at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Sophie. Basil, thank you. The time is just after quarter past six, our top story this evening. Boris Johnson fights for his political career as he is grilled by MPs over lockdown parties in Downing Street. And coming up, the wedding interrupted when some of the guests had to rush off to a rescue off the South Wales coast. And on BBC London, warnings that the Chancellor's latest plans for childcare will only put more pressure on the sector. And going for gold, we hear from Olympian Helen Glover about her ambitions for Paris 2024. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has made a deeply emotional and unreserved apology to thousands of women who were forced to give up their babies for adoption over a period of three decades, calling it the stuff of nightmares. Until the 1970s, forced adoption was relatively common in Scotland, with thousands of children taken from their mothers who were mostly young and not married. The women were often left in the dark about what was happening to their babies. Our correspondent Duncan Kennedy first reported on this story a decade ago and has played a crucial role in bringing their traumatic stories to light. This is his latest report. These women have waited 50 years for this day. They're just some of the 60,000 Scottish mothers forced to give up their babies for adoption simply because they weren't married. This is a very big day. This is an enormous day for us, one that I don't think any of us really expected. They came to the Scottish Parliament for an unprecedented moment. Official recognition from Scotland's First Minister that historical forced adoptions had caused grief, heartbreak and shame. The horror of what happened to these women is almost impossible to comprehend. It is the stuff of nightmares. Forced adoptions took place in the three decades after World War II, when pregnancy out of wedlock was considered shameful. Thousands of the women were coerced into giving up their babies for adoption. In many cases, it was state employees, like doctors, nurses and social workers, who put them under pressure. Over the past two years, the BBC has highlighted dozens of their stories, revealing the horrors of losing their babies. Our reports helping generate the momentum for today's historic moment, with Nicola Sturgeon becoming only the second world leader to apologise. To the mothers who had their babies taken away from them, to the sons and the daughters who were separated from their parents, to the fathers who were denied their rights, and to the families who have lived with the legacy, 
For the decades of pain that you have suffered, I offer today a sincere, heartfelt and unreserved apology. We are sorry. For the birth mothers, it was enough to unburden years of guilt. With the speech over, the women emerged, a lifelong feeling of shame now at an end. You got the apology? We've got it, and it's been a long haul, and it's great. Uh, what are your thoughts? I actually can't believe that's actually happened after the day I sat in the house and you interviewed me the first time, and I thought, this will never happen, and here it's happened, and it's wonderful. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long, long time coming, yeah. yeah. They have waited a lifetime for today's lifeline. Official confirmation that they did no wrong and should not have been forced to give up the babies they had yearned to keep. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, in Edinburgh. Some more of the news now. And a man arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was set alight in Edgbaston has now been arrested for a similar incident in Ealing last month. Meanwhile, the 70-year-old victim of the Edgbaston attack has been named as Mohamed Reyes. He remains in a serious but stable condition in hospital following a skin graft operation. 25 people were injured this morning after this ship tipped over at a dockyard in Edinburgh. It's a research vessel that was in a dry dock in Leith. 15 people were taken to hospital after it ended up listing at a 45 degree angle. A major incident was declared. Alexandra McKenzie reports. The dramatic image of the research vessel, the petrol, it began listing to one side early this morning, finally tipping over on Leith's Imperial dock. It triggered a major emergency operation, including the Scottish Ambulance Service, the Coast Guard, Scotland's Charity Aid Ambulance and the Fire and Rescue Service. 21 people were taken to hospital and 12 others were treated here at the docks. We understand that the petrol became dislodged from its holding on the dry dock. We don't know at this stage how that happened, but an investigation is underway. The 76-metre-long ship is currently owned by the US Navy and has not been used since 2020. Now the petrol still on its side and many of those on board remain in hospital. Alexandra McKenzie, BBC News, Leith. And some breaking news for you tonight. The RMT union has just announced that rail strikes by its members at 14 train companies on the 30th of March and the 1st of April have been suspended following discussions with management today. The union has already resolved its row with Network Rail in a similar dispute. The rail delivery group said it was good news for customers and staff. The man accused of killing nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell in Liverpool has told a jury that he is a dad, not a killer. 34-year-old Thomas Cashman has been giving evidence for a second day at Manchester Crown Court. He denies shooting Olivia at her home last August, insisting he was getting the blame for something he didn't do. Our North of England correspondent Judith Moritz sent this report. Thomas Cashman describes himself as a high-level drugs dealer, selling cannabis by the kilo and making £5,000 a week. But he says he's not a murderer. Last August, when shots were heard on the streets of Liverpool, he says he was smoking a joint with friends. And that he is not the gunman who shot nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell dead inside her home. The prosecution say he shot the little girl by mistake whilst he was trying to execute another drugs dealer. Thomas Cashman spent today giving evidence in his own defence. He said, I'm getting the blame for something I haven't done. I didn't do it and I'm getting the blame for it. I'm getting blamed for killing a child and I've got my own children. I'm a dad. I'm not a killer. I'm a dad. In the witness box, Thomas Cashman became emotional as he denied murdering Olivia. He also said it wasn't true that on the night of the shooting, he'd gone to the home of a woman he'd had an affair with, changed his clothes and confessed. He said the woman, whose name is protected by court order, is trying to ruin his life and wants a reward for the information. 
Thomas Cashman accepts that he can be seen on CCTV moving around the area both before and after the shooting. But he said it was the typical behaviour of a local lad selling cannabis. The 34-year-old denies murdering Olivia and four other offences. He left court amidst high security. He'll be back in the witness box again tomorrow morning. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Manchester. In other news, a teenager has been found guilty of murdering a 15-year-old boy who was stabbed to death as he walked home from school in West Yorkshire. Kyrie McLean was stabbed twice after being ambushed outside North Huddersfield Trust School last September. A 17-year-old was found guilty of murder at Leeds Crown Court. His 15-year-old accomplice had previously admitted murder. The Prince of Wales has thanked British troops based near the Ukrainian border for defending our freedoms as he kicked off a surprise trip to Poland. He said the two-day trip will allow him to personally thank troops and pay tribute to the inspiring humanity of the Polish people helping Ukrainian refugees. This year's nominations for the BAFTA Television Awards have been announced. The BBC dramas This Is Going To Hurt and The Responder lead the way with six nominations each and the BBC's News at 10 was also nominated for its coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The search is on for the family of one of the UK's last World War II veterans who died alone in his flat in London as preparations are made for his funeral next week. Flight Sergeant Peter Brown was born in Jamaica. He joined the RAF in 1943 and served as a radio operator and air gunner on Lancaster bombers. He never married and had no children, but it's hoped some surviving relatives may be found. Helen Wilkinson reports. This is Peter Brown when he was serving as a flight sergeant in the Royal Air Force in 1945. Aged 17, it's thought the young Jamaican had travelled thousands of miles so he could volunteer to fly and fight in World War II. After training, he flew as a crew member in the Avro Lancaster, Britain's famous strategic bomber that was used as the RAF's main weapon against targets in Germany. In December, the Air Force veteran died alone in his flat in West London. Fiercely independent, stubborn as hell, but a wonderful guy, always smiling. He was never miserable. We sort of chatted about his, his health. He was always complaining about one thing or another, but he kept going. So I got a, my knee hurt, but I got to walk to the shops, got to keep it going. Peter Brown had no known relatives. Now officials are searching for family members to attend his funeral. After Peter Brown came to Britain, he trained as a wireless operator and air gunner, and he flew in a Lancaster bomber like this one when he served in 625 Squadron. He was one of 450 young black men from the Caribbean, Africa and parts of the UK to fly with the RAF during the Second World War. There were specialists. They became a tightly knit team. Everyone's survival depending on everyone's ability to do their jobs. They were the best and the brightest. They took only the best and the brightest. His job was one of that team. Without him, they would not have been able to go forward. It's hoped that anyone related to Peter Brown or anyone who knew him will get in touch ahead of his funeral next week so he can be given the very best send-off he deserves. Helena Wilkinson, BBC News. And finally, to a wedding in South Wales that took a dramatic turn at the weekend when five of the guests had to leave the church to respond to an emergency call. The RNLI volunteers were all at the service for a fellow crew member's special day when they were suddenly called out to rescue two people cut off by an incoming tide, as Thomas Morgan reports. It was, it was, it was a really lovely day. Saturday was Jessica and Mark Broadway's wedding in Porthcaul, South Wales. And every couple, of course, wants their wedding day to go as smoothly as possible without any unexpected surprises. Because Mark's one of the volunteers on the lifeboat, we always knew that, you know, the RNLI was going to be a part of the wedding. Yeah, and, and a, few, a few of the lifeboat chaps were involved in the wedding. Very, very helpful people to have around. <laughs> and so, yeah, lots of lifeboats. Little did they know just how big a part they'd play. As the ceremony began, the vicar asked everyone to turn their phones off unless they were volunteers of the RNLI. And then the inevitable happened. How much of the wedding did you miss? How much? Uh, all of it. I was there for 17 minutes and he just started the sermon, so perhaps not a bad time to leave. 
And uh, yeah, that was it. So I missed all the wedding. The group swung into action after two people had been cut off by the incoming tide 10 miles away. They were rescued safe and well, grateful, but also a bit apologetic. Thank you. Thank you so much. So honestly, I was in church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the life guys are getting married. Oh, oh no. But it's all right, it was before the sermon. <laughs> As one of the land crew, Ruth waited for the team to get back and had to clean the boat down before the day was done. Are you gutted to miss the free drink and the cake? Well, if I'm absolutely honest, yes, but I'm sure I'll make up for it. This was far more important and this takes precedence. It was, it was so good to be able to congratulate them on you know, a successful shout. Um, great to see them after they've done what they do so well. An unexpected turn of events on what was an unforgettable day. Thomas Morgan, BBC News, Port of Weather now with Stav. Hello. Hello there, Sophie. Thank you very much. Good evening to you. It's going to remain unsettled for the rest of this week. Low pressure always nearby. And we've had some very windy weather across western Scotland today through Thursday, Friday. We hold on to the mild theme for many of us, but there will be rain at times, followed by sunshine and showers. Some of them will be heavy and thundery. We've got a line of thundery showers spreading their way across England, Wales, southern Scotland over the next few hours. Some really heavy rain for a while. It'll be quite blustery too. More showers, long spells of rain pushing into southern and western areas later on but because of the wind direction and also the fact it's going to be breezy temperatures no longer than around four to nine degrees in the southeast so into tomorrow we've still got our area of low pressure with us you'll notice though more isobars across the southern half of the country so it's a reverse of fortunes tomorrow it's england and wales which will see the strongest of the winds and there will be further outbreaks of rain at times so some heavy showers again perhaps some of them thundery across pretty much anywhere but there will be some good spells of sunshine in between but very blustery we look to the south though to this area of rain persistent rain which will move in later on but of uncertainty that could be a bit further northwards or it could be where it's showing now gusty winds you'll notice there the black uh, wind arrows uh, up to around 40 maybe uh, 50 miles an hour gust in exposure but very mild indeed again up to the mid-teens uh, across southern and eastern areas. So that heavy rain clears through uh, Thursday night across the southeast. Friday, though, looks to be a blustery day with sunshine and showers. Some of these showers really will be heavy. There'll be scattered thunderstorms around, some really heavy rainfall at times, some sunshine in between. Again, another mild day, but things are set to change. Briefly, I think as we head into the weekend, it looks like we see a plunge of northerly winds. It will be turning colder, increasing chance of some winteriness, particularly uh, in northern areas. But I think the signs of it looking to be short-lived, it may turn mild as we move through next week again. That's it from me, Sophie. Stuff, thank you. And that is it from us. It is time now for the news where you are. Goodbye.